Hi there, AP Euro students, and welcome to today's lecture, Unit 4, Section 4.3, which is going to cover 18th century society and demographics. So the first main topic of this lecture is going to focus on economic expansion in the 18th century. You will notice that some of these themes and topics are similar to what we learned about in Unit 3, so you might recognize these as, as continuities from, what, from Unit 3 into Unit 4. Now, we're focusing more on the 18th century, so it's important to note that by the year 1700, which is the start of the 18th century, the great majority of European people made their living through farming, and the everyday lives of most Europeans had changed very little since the Middle Ages. However, new technologies and social arrangements would start to dramatically transform European life on all levels. So let's start by taking a look at some changes in agriculture. Again, some of this will likely be a review from what we learned in Unit 3, but it's always good to review some of this important content. Now, up until the 18th century, most of Europe used medieval patterns of agriculture. About 80% of the people in Western Europe earned their livings and made their entire livelihood through working in agriculture in the countryside. Now, this could vary throughout Europe. For example, Eastern Europe saw higher levels of uh, people, specifically serfs, working in agriculture, and this was become, because manorialism was still very prevalent. But areas like the Netherlands, especially the province of Holland, maybe did not see as quite as high a percentage because it was more densely populated and more people were living in towns and cities. Now, because of these medieval patterns of agriculture, crop yields, meaning how much a crop produced, had really not significantly improved since the Middle Ages. Crops were also unreliable it was not uncommon for harvest to fail about every eight to nine years, and bad weather could aggravate this cycle. And when the harvest failed, this caused bouts of famine, starvation, and overall made people more susceptible to disease. Now, these medieval systems of agriculture could support a large population, but they never produced an abundance of food. They never produced a surplus. This is what we would call subsistence agriculture. Um, medieval patterns of agriculture were also based on this idea of the open field system and the idea of the commons. So the land around villages was divided into several large fields and in those fields peasants would be assigned a single strip uh, that belonged to them but overall the field would be farmed as a community. There were also no fences or hedges separating these different fields or strips. They were very communal. And in the open field system, crops were rotated on a three-year cycle. And you can see an example of that in the upper right corner, meaning that one field would have, say, barley, another field would have wheat, and then the third field would be left fallow or empty for a year to replenish nutrients in the soil, and sometimes that's where animals would graze, graze. Villages often maintained open meadows for hay and pasture so that everyone in the village could use the same land to graze their animals. Now, this, these systems, while subsistent, still had major disadvantages. Poverty was prevalent, and peasants were very susceptible to hardships such as bad harvests and everything that came with it. Also, the nobility often held the best land, and this continues well into the modern era. And the continued manorialism in Eastern Europe stifled economic development in that region and kept the population very illiterate and poor. Now, the big change in agriculture occurs with the Agricultural Revolution, which we talked about a little bit already. The Agricultural Revolution was caused by a desire for increased profits. And so in order to increase the profit, um, these landowners began to seek out innovations in farm production. In the 17th and even into the 18th century in particular, 
the rising price of bread encouraged more profit seeking from landowners. So landowners realized that if they could produce more wheat, they could make more money due to that rising cost of bread. The agricultural revolution began in the Netherlands, where population pressure encouraged more efficient land use and also in England, and England actually had the most striking agricultural improvements. So the agricultural revolution consists of new techniques and new technology that were designed to increase agricultural output. I will say that one more time. It's about new techniques and new technology designed to increase agricultural output. So some examples of these new techniques and technologies included the iron plow, the drill planter, and new field rotation. Um, these uh, techniques and technologies allowed the earth to be churned more deeply, which allowed for better seed planting. Also, new animal breeding methods were used. There were new methods of fertilization, so there was no longer a need to leave one field fallow or empty, and this of course led to an increase in crop production. And the increased crop production led to more winter fodder or food for livestock, so that meant that the size and the amount of livestock animals increased as well. Combined with new methods of breeding, we start to see better livestock animals that were able to produce more milk and more meat. And overall, this meant more food for both animals and human beings, right? So all of these things would work together to improve, you know, the, the output from agriculture and improve also um, animal husbandry uh, within livestock animals. Now, the enclosure movement is another important component of the agricultural revolution because the enclosure movement dismantled the open field and commons system. This was when landlords began to enclose or consolidate their lands to increase production. So this is when they start to physically enclose land with fences and hedges, and it really brought an end to that um, sort of co the, the, the idea of a common field for everyone to use. So not su surprisingly, this led to a lot of protests from peasants. However, the English Parliament passed laws known as the Enclosure Acts that supported the enclosure movement by privatizing land that was previously considered public. And the Enclosure Acts are, are considered very controversial um, in terms of uh, uh, overall history because it's, it's literally the rich profiting at the expense of the poor. So, of course, one of the big negatives of the enclosure system is that peasants lost grazing privileges. And also, this changed the relationship between peasants and landlords because landlords no longer felt responsible for the well-being of their peasants. And this had really been a long-held tradition since the Middle Ages. Um, this meant that a lot of small communities dissolved but at the benefit of the landlords. Again, this is an example of the rich profiting at the expense of the poor. Now, an advantage to the enclosure movement is this led to the beginning of commercial agriculture. Again, the beginning of commercial agriculture. This is what allowed crops and animals to be raised by fewer people. So we have more food being created by fewer people which means we now not only have a food surplus, but we also have a labor surplus. And that labor surplus is necessary for creating a workforce that would go be the labor base for industrialization later in the century. So this is an important change, right? Because small independent English peasant farmers could not compete with this emerging commercial agriculture. They could not compete with entrepreneurial large landowners. And so as a result, many English peasants, those who owned land and those who did not, were often forced to leave their land, leave their livelihoods, and become wage earners in the city. Again, they would become the, um, the labor base for the Industrial Revolution. Right, so that's the overall significance. More food, 
and more food being produced by fewer people means there's lower prices for food, there's less labor, that po and this population growth would lead to a surplus of labor. So really one of the big takeaways I want you to have from this is that the agricultural revolution is an absolutely necessary precursor to the industrial revolution, which we'll, which we'll start to talk about a little bit more later on in this lecture. Now, a quick reminder about how this pattern of agricultural development differs between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. This agricultural revolution improved farm production in Western Europe, especially places like England, the Netherlands, and France. But in Eastern Europe, it had a very limited impact. And this is because of the continuation of manorialism in Eastern Europe, where really the relationship of serfs to the lords did not change. Um, and there had not ever been open field systems in place in Eastern European agriculture. So serfs did not really have any land privileges to, to lose. The biggest impact of, the biggest agricultural change, I should say, to occur in Eastern Europe was the introduction of new crops like corn and the potato, which of course came from the New World. And when these crops were introduced to the, to the Eastern European diet, they increased the nutritional gain and the um, overall health of many European peasants. So now we're going to look at how these agricultural changes affected changes in demographics. So first of all, demographics or demography is the study of population growth and movement, especially as it impacts the Earth's environment and natural resources. Now, the traditional demographic patterns of Europe prior to the 18th century is that the population would increase gradually over several generations, but then crop failures or disease would dramatically re reduce population levels to the point where entire villages could disappear. So there was this pattern where the population would increase over several generations, then we would have famine and disease, and the population would drop off, and then it would build up again over several generations. We have famine and disease, and it would go back down. Now, this traditional pattern was broken in the 18th century with the introduction of the agricultural revolution and a greater availability of food, which would lead to a population increase. Because remember, more food equals more babies. So here's an example. In the year 1700, at the start of the 18th century, the European population was about 100 to 120 million people. And by the end of the century, in the year 1800, the European population was about 180 to 190 million people. And this population growth would continue into the 19th and even 20th centuries. So let's look at why this population growth occurred. First of all, there were fewer epidemic diseases. Um, this population growth is due more to a decline in death rates in the 18th century. Not so much an increase in birth rates, but a decline in death rates. Uh, the disappearance of the plague is an important factor, uh, and this was caused by stricter quarantine measures. So if and when there were outbreaks of the plague, Europeans now knew to quarantine those plague victims to prevent the spread. Also, there was improved sanitation and hygiene. Uh, there were improvements in some water supplies and some sewer systems. And cleaner water ultimately also led to better public health and the limitation of disease. Although, keep in mind that urban engineering, as, as we know it today, with you know plumbing and true sewer systems, would not develop until the later 19th century. Perhaps one of the most important contributing factors, however, is that there were better and more stable food supplies. This better nourished population meant lower death rates, specifically more grain production of things like wheat and barley allowed people to live longer, healthier lives. 
Also, the introduction of the potato into the 18th century um, allowed for a more nutritious diet, and potatoes were very easy to grow. Even your poorest peasants could survive off of the potato um, because it required less land for cultivation. And also it was easy to prepare, unlike grain, which had to be ground into flour and the flour had to be baked into bread. With a potato, you basically had to you know, clean it off, boil it, and there you have a dinner. Also, there were improvements in the climate conditions of the 18th century. So there were fewer cold, rainy winters that could potentially destroy a harvest for the next few seasons. Um, but however, despite these, these important changes in, in food and nutrition, birth rates did not rise significantly during the 18th century. Again, the population growth is due to a decline in death rates, not so much an increase in birth rates. And the reason birth rates did not rise significantly is because many average Europeans were still getting married at a later age to delay the amount of children that they have because more children means more mouths to feed. So again, the population was the population growth was largely due to a decline in death rates. Now the ex the exception to this pattern is in England because England did see both a rise in birth rates and a decline in death rates. And the reason for this is because England in general had greater economic opportunities and also more geographic mobility for young people, both of which tended to encourage earlier marriage. And of course, earlier marriage meant that couples were likely to have more children. So now let's look at some of the social and economic changes that are taking place in the 18th century as well. This will also cover some of the content that we learned about in Unit 3, but a little bit of review is always a good thing. So one of the important economic changes was the growth of the cottage industry, which is also called the putting out system. This new cottage industry allowed rural agricultural workers to supplement their income, especially during the off seasons of agriculture. We can consider this to be an early form of manufacturing and mass production, but it's not a factory system. We're still many, many decades away from a factory. Now in the cottage system, there were two main participants. There, were the, there was the merchant capitalist, which you can see is this well-dressed man right here, and the rural workers in various different cottages. So the merchant would loan or put out raw materials to several cottage workers who then processed the raw materials in their own homes and returned the finished product to the merchant. So for example, the first cottage might work on turning raw wool into yarn and then the next cottage would take that yarn and weave it into cloth. And then the third cottage would dye the cloth and then it would be given back to the merchant and the merchant would pay everyone in the cottages for their labor. Now, the development of the cottage system or the cottage industry is an important part of the increasing international capitalism of Western Europe because many of the goods produced by the cottage industry would be sold at international markets. And the cottage industry was especially well suited for producing things like textiles, housewares, buttons, gloves, and musical instruments. So more common everyday goods, not so much luxury goods. Now another important social change is the growth and changing patterns of population in cities. So by the time we get to the 18th century, cities were growing rapidly due to that population explosion that we just discussed on the previous slide. And um, some of the biggest cities, some of the most notable concentrations of urban centers began to shift from the Mediterranean more to Northern and Western Europe. Specifically, we would see the growth of capital cities and port cities. 
The consolidation of monarchs and capitals also caused a growth of bureaucracies, armies, and courts, as well as the industries to support them. So absolutism in some capacity, and even, you know, the capital cities in, in other countries like uh, London and Amsterdam, uh, contributed to this consolidation and to this population growth in the cities. Also, port cities, so cities that are on the coast, grew with overseas trade, especially if they were connected to any of the Atlantic trade routes. This meant that some of the older medieval cities, cities that were landlocked or had been considered guild centers or religious centers, these cities began to decline in their significance, their influence, and their population. Also, the cottage industry was encouraging more rural labor. And so while we have some people moving to the cities, especially these capital cities and port cities, we also may see people leaving the older medieval cities to find work in the countryside in the cottage industry. Now, there were also some new cities that began to emerge out of the growth of small towns. Um, this was caused by improved agricultural production, which promoted the growth of nearby market towns and other urban centers that provided local farmers with consumer goods and with recreation. And so these newer towns and cities were actually also supported by the growing cottage industry in Western Europe. However, even though we are talking about this demographic shift and these social changes that are leading to increased population in the cities, it's still very important to note that even by the year 1800, even by the time we get to the 19th century, most Europeans are still living in the countryside. We really do not see that shift where more Europeans are living in cities than in the countryside until we get to like the 20th century. Now, the last economic change to discuss on this slide is inflation. So economic activity and this demographic growth, this increasing population after the year 1730 began to encourage more inflation across Europe. This growth, growing population led to rising prices of consumer goods because of an increased demand on things like food, land, goods, and employment. This also meant that rents rose significantly, but wages did not really keep up with, those, with that inflation. Because if we think about it, with this increased population, there's now a large labor pool. So labor, if there's a surplus of labor, um, a great supply of labor, then wages are going to be kept low, right? Because there's a great supply, but not necessarily a high demand. And all of this contributes to the growing gap between rich and poor, which will continue throughout the 18th and into the 19th century and actually become very pronounced in many areas. Another important economic change, really social and economic change, is the introduction of the Industrial Revolution. Now, we're going to really dive into the Industrial Revolution in uh, Unit 6, all right? But for now, I do want to give you a little bit of an introduction because it does start to begin in the later 18th century. So the Industrial Revolution is probably one of the most important transformations in human civilization, right? The first one being the agricultural revolution of the Neolithic era, which is when humans went from being hunter-gatherers to living in settled agricultural communities. The Industrial Revolution is going to be the other major transformative event, and this is the event that affects everyone, regardless of their social class, regardless of their gender or their economic station. So the Industrial Revolution fundamentally is an economic change in the source of energy for work. Basically, what this means is that human and animal power will be replaced with mechanical power. Now, up until this point, civilization, human civilization everywhere in the world, had always been organized around the basic principle of human and animal power, 
and therefore all of the economic, social, and political structures supported the idea that civilization was based on human and animal power. But the substitution of human and animal labor by machines and their power changed these basic building blocks of civilization forever. And the relationship of people to their work would be fundamentally altered. So really with the Industrial Revolution, there are two types of changes. There is technological innovation and organizational changes. The technological innovation made it possible to produce goods made by machine rather than by hand. So these are the new machines and new technology that are being introduced. This is what would cause the organizational changes. So the organizational changes move the place of work from homes and farms to factories where workers were brought in to run the new machinery. Work was now divided according to what was necessary to make the machinery operate most efficiently. And these machines were larger, they were more complex, and they were more expensive, which led to the formation of large businesses to own the machines, to control the machines, to make the machines run, and these large businesses had to be equipped with plenty of capital. And capital means both money and supplies and people. Now the Industrial Revolution began in Great Britain, so it was really only evident in Great Britain in the later 18th century. Again, we'll look closely, more closely at why it begins in Great Britain later in Unit 6. But for now, it's important to note that one of the main reasons it began in Britain as opposed to elsewhere is because Britain had a well-developed middle class and a capitalist structure in their economy. Also, the profits from trade and cottage industries across Britain allowed for these merchant capitalists to invest in new industrial machines and factories. So, the combination of agricultural improvements, population increase, good transportation, and stable government allowed Britain to take the lead in industrialization before the rest of the European continent. And the Industrial Revolution ultimately led to a rise in prosperity and therefore an increased standard of living for some Europeans. This greater prosperity was associated with increased literacy, education, and rich cultural lives. And by the end of the 18th century, a higher proportion of Europeans were better fed, they were healthier, they lived longer, and they were more secure and comfortable in their material well-being. And so, of course, consider this is not just because of the Industrial Revolution, but this is also caused by the Agricultural Revolution. And so when we think about that, we can definitely see it this increased standard of living on a wider scale. But at the same time, this relative prosperity that we start to see was balanced by increasing numbers of poverty throughout Europe. So that brings us to part two of the lecture today, which are the social and demographic trends in 18th century Europe. So we'll look, look a little bit more closely at family structure um, for different social classes and um, other patterns like that. All right, so in regards to marriage and the family, um, this is going to be different between Northwestern Europe where, and, and then Eastern Europe. So in Northwestern Europe, having three generation families was pretty rare by 1700, and this was due to higher mortality rates and later marriages. This meant that many people did not know their grandparents. And so this also meant that in Western Europe, we see more nuclear families rather than extended families. A nuclear family is really just the mother, the father, and the children, whereas an extended family might include uh, grandparents and aunt and uncles and, and a larger uh, amount of family members. In Western Europe, we know that people usually did not marry very young. They would wait until maybe their mid to late 20s to get married. Again, to limit the amount of children that they had. 
And this also meant that most households usually had only five to six people. And again, by limiting the amount of children, um, this helps to sort of keep a check on some population growth. Children would usually live with their parents until they were teenagers when they then went out to try to find work on their own. So it's also important to know why was marriage delayed in many Western European areas? And this is for your average European, not your high class, you know, nobleman or anything like that. So um, on average, the age of marriage was higher prior to 1750, especially for the lower classes, right? So for the, the late 20s, generally for both men and women. Um, and this is because these people felt that they had to support themselves economically before they could marry. Uh, for example, even women had to raise money for a dowry, which is sort of like a, a payment to the husband, uh, to help her, her future husband buy land or a house, or sometimes the sons would have to wait for their father to die in order to inherit money so that they could buy land or a house to support their family. Now, many peasants actually had to get permission from their local lord or landowner in order to marry, and many of these local lords worried that too much early marriage would increase the number of those in poverty and the number of those that would need, you know, some type of social support. So the pattern of late marriage was really based on economic stability, and this fostered a sort of culture of self-reliance and independence in Western Europe as well. Now, in Eastern Europe, it was quite different. In Eastern Europe, marriages usually happened by the time people were 20 years old and they immediately started having children. This meant that families generally were much larger than in Western Europe, and we could see anywhere from 9 to 20 family members living in a single household. The prevalence of serfdom also encouraged large families because this allowed for a larger labor force. For example, in Poland, serfs were forbidden from marrying outside their estate, and widows and widowers within these, these serf communities were often required to remarry so that they could keep having children. And some areas um, actually required also legal permission of the local lord or landowner for marriage. And um, this was actually pretty common in, in Eastern Europe, even more than it was in Western Europe. Now let's look a little bit more closely at gender roles and especially um, the, the, the experience of women and um, the development of families before 1750. All right, so before 1750, women functioned mainly within the confines of family life. Your average woman would spend the first part of her life maintaining her parents' household and the later part of her life maintaining her own household. Girls usually lived at home until their labor was more valuable elsewhere when they might then leave the home to work as a servant somewhere else. But in these situations, young girls could frequently be mistreated in um, other households, which was unfortunate but common. Now, the chief goal of many young women was to accumulate enough money for a dowry, D-O-W-R-Y. A dowry was um, an economic contribution from the wife. So the wife was, a, when a woman got married, she was expected to make an immediate contribution of capital. So that could be money or land or some other valuable supplies. Um, make this immediate contribution of capital to the marriage to establish the household um, because marriage was seen as a joint economic undertaking. Um, and also this was another reason why couples were very conscious about limiting the number of children, especially in Western Europe, because the amount of children could affect their financial and social stability. Peasant women would spend most of their time tending to the needs of their farmer husband or completing the farming themselves. So keep in mind that even though we say women were limited to the roles of wife and mother, 
Uh, this does not mean that they were ever idle, right? They were still working very hard to support the family unit all throughout their lives. Now, women who were married to, say, artisans or merchants and might live in urban areas, these women might have um, some responsibility over household finances, or they might help, the manage, help manage the family business, or even take over businesses if their father or husband died. But despite this, it's important to remember that many occupations and professions were closed to women. Now let's take a look at attitudes towards children prior to 1750. Now, even with the best intentions to limit the number of children, most women often gave birth to six or more children throughout their lifetime, but it was rare for all six of those children to make it to adulthood because there were very high infant mortality rates. Women of lower classes generally breastfed their children for several years because this was a way to help limit fertility and this pattern continued well after 1750. However, women of the aristocracy and the upper middle classes would not breastfeed their own children. This was seen as crude and undignified, and so instead they hired other women known as wet nurses to, to feed those children, um, which also meant that these upper class women were you know, generally able to have more children. And this was also a pattern that continued after 1750. Now, before 1750, there really were not very many illegitimate children born in Europe. Now, illegitimate, illegitimacy refers to a child who was born to parents who are not married. Um, and this is because even though premarital sex was commonplace, pregnancy was often a compelling reason for a couple to marry. Uh, there would be a lot of community pressure for a couple to marry if the uh, girl became pregnant. And this also reflected the powerful social controls of traditional villages and village life um, in sort of agricultural Europe. Now let's talk about how children might be treated or how children might be viewed. Um, so children were not as coddled and cherished as our society today. Uh, sort of use them. Children were often treated with indifference and maybe even strict di physical discipline. Um, this, the, the, the use of wet nurses by the upper classes is a good example, right? Women did not want to breastfeed or even spend much time with their own children if they were in the upper classes. But even in the lower classes, there was reluctance to get attached to children because of the high infant mortality rates. It was very common for children to die before they were five to 10 years old. And so as a result, parents were reluctant to become too emotionally attached to their children. Um, it was infant, um, more, child and infant mortality was so common that doctors often declined to care for sick children because they believed that there was so little that could be done. Also in these sort of lower classes, many children were viewed as sources of labor. And so many children would be expected to work in the fields or in the cottage industry or later on in the factories um, at very young ages. And um, as a result, they would often be subject to severe discipline. Many parents had this attitude that their main task as parents was to break the will of their children in order to make them obedient. In fact, there's this famous quote from the 18th century that says, spare the rod and spoil the child. So spare the rod means like, you know, not hitting your child. And if you don't hit them, that means you're spoiling them. This was a term coined by the uh, famous novelist, Daniel Defoe. However, as we get into the later 18th century, the humanitarianism and enlightenment optimism regarding human progress emphasize better treatment of children. Um, so these attitudes start to change a little bit later. Rousseau in particular encouraged greater love and understanding towards children. And uh, gradually over time, parents would start to grow closer to their children and um, have more attachment to them. 
Now, let's look at how these patterns in marriage and the family change after 1750. Now, after 1750, we actually start to see more attempts at early birth control to help reduce um, unwanted pregnancies in many European couples. Um, this was not always uh, effective, right, because this is before modern contraception, but there was still an effort to try to limit um, pregnancy both within marriage and before marriage. Also, after 1750, we start to see uh, a slight change in that there were more people marrying for love and not just for economic reasons. The growth of the cottage industry with its increased income resulted in higher rates of people marrying for love instead of just purely economic reasons. Basically, young people had more economic stability and that meant that maybe they did not have to wait as long to become financially independent. Um, also, in some parts of Europe, arranged marriages for economic reasons also declined. And even though there were often laws and regulations on marriage, especially in the German states, these were increasingly ignored as there was more interest in marrying for love rather than for social and economic stability. However, there's also increasing illegitimacy in, um, in uh, Europe after 1750. Uh, so this means more, more babies born to parents who were not married. Now, after 1750, there tends to be a lot more, um, uh, or I should say after 1750, there's a much higher increase in the birth rate. And this is caused a lot by the increasing illegitimacy. Illegitimate birth rates increased as much as 33% in certain areas. And this is because, frankly, fewer young people were abstaining from premarital sex. Um, and the mobility of the population, right? So young people leaving their villages and moving to big cities where there maybe is, wasn't as much traditional social pressure encouraged, you know, new types of dating and sexual and even marital relationships, which were not as subject to the social controls of village life. Um, but this, uh, but in Germany, illegitimate births were a result of um, some open rebellion against class laws limiting marriage among the poor, and illegitimacy began to decline when marriage restrictions were rescinded. Now, women in cities and factories had limited economic independence. Um, most young women were not motivated by visions of emancipation and sexual liberation. Most city women probably looked to marriage and family life as an escape from a really hard and difficult lifestyle. And many intended marriages did not take place as poor economic and social conditions scared men away from the commitment. Right, so moving on. There was also an increase in the amount of people working away from home, especially many young people worked within their families until they could start their own households. Uh, boys would really work in agriculture or weaving as part of the cottage industry. Girls would spin thread or tend to animals. But increasingly, boys began to work away from the home. For example, boys in towns might be apprenticed to a craftsman for 7 to 14 years, in order to learn a trade and perhaps may even be admitted to a guild, but they were not allowed to marry during this time. And that was more of an exception rather than the norm because more often young men might drift from one tough job to another, especially if they were in the cities. There was also an increasing amount of young girls who worked away from home at an early age. And again, this is more common after 1750 for both the, the young men and the young women. Um, for young women, opportunities were often more limited than they were for men. Um, the most common work was domestic service, so working as a servant in another family's household. Uh, and again, these are women who are hoping to save money 
um, either to send to their parents or save money for their dowry when they get married. And when these young people left to work away from home, this actually benefited their own parents uh, who had one less mouth to feed. But still, servant girls had very little real independence and were often vulnerable to considerable mistreatment. And it was not uncommon for the upper classes to exploit their servants sexually. And of course, this was not good for the servants because if a servant girl became pregnant, she would quickly be fired. And often at that point, prostitution or petty thievery became her only alternatives. So related to some of these social and demographic changes, we also see some unfortunate developments with the um, emergence of more infanticide and foundling hospitals. So infanticide refers to the, uh, the killing of infants, right? And a foundling hospital is an orphanage. So children could be a very serious economic hardship for many European peoples. And that meant that infanticide almost certainly occurred both for unmarried and married people. Um, most common was some type of accidental suffocation uh, because of course there was a child, a high child mortality rate. And so if a child accidentally suffocated, there was not really anything that anyone could do to prove that it wasn't an accident. Children, unwanted children, were also sometimes abandoned to foundling hospitals or orphanages. This was especially common with illegitimate children whose parents could not support them. Um, there tended to be a trend here, an economic trend. For example, in Paris, more children would be abandoned to orphanages as food prices increased in the cities. But this also meant that serious overcrowding could occur at these foundling homes. And um, this was often a fatal environment for infants. You know, the mortality rate for infants in these orphanages could be anywhere from 50 to 90 percent, so much so that it was sometimes viewed as a legal form of infanticide. But while that is unfortunate, there's also important developments in education. So education traditionally played a very limited role in the lives of most Europeans, and most Europeans never learned to read, especially the girls. But during the 18th century, we do see the basic literacy rates start to increase because of the expansion of education. Uh, this includes the growth of elementary schools that taught children aged 7 to 12 some basic literacy and religion, these elementary schools were often supported by churches, specifically the Protestant and Catholic reformations in earlier centuries had encouraged literacy as a means of instilling religious beliefs. Um, but despite these, these changes, it's important to remember that many, many common people still received no formal education. It wasn't until the 18th century that the idea of universal education gradually took hold. This began with the, quote, little schools or elementary schools that began to appear in some parts of Europe in the 17th century. And the first areas of Europe that really began to support the growth and attendance of elementary schools were the German states, including Prussia which actually made attendance at elementary schools compulsory in the early 18th century. And this would lead the way to universal compulsory education. And um, these policies were encouraged by the old Protestant idea that every Christian should be able to read and interpret the Bible for themselves. And also um, that education was seen as a way to make the population effectively serve the state. So, you know, mass education was actually a way to support absolutism. In fact, even the Austrian Empress Maria Theresa established a system of elementary education in the Austrian Empire in 1774. Beyond this, we also see the growth of parish schools in England and Scotland in the 18th century for all ages. And France would even begin to establish Christian schools in the late 17th century 
which taught religion as well as reading and writing. All of this growth in education was also supported by the Enlightenment commitment to greater knowledge through critical thinking, this reinforced interest in education during the 18th century. So this increased educational opportunities also led to new patterns of literacy. All right, so literacy has increased pretty significantly in Europe by 1800. For example, almost 90% of the Scottish population, the, the Scottish male population, I should say, was able to read. Um, whereas back in 1600, it was maybe only one out of six Scottish men. Um, in France, two out of every three adult men could read. In some places, it might be as high as 90%, but back in 1600, again, maybe only one out of six men were able to read. In Britain, over 50% of adult men were able to read, as opposed to only 25% in the year 1600. And overall, women were increasingly literate, but still lagged behind men in general pretty significantly. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about health and hygiene. This is our last slide of the lecture. So we start to see, of course, an increased life expectancy um, in the 18th century. The average lifespan of Europeans increased from about 25 to 35 years in the 18th century, and this was largely the result of the disappearance of plague and starvation and also the fact that more time was spent on children, um, you know, in their care and their upbringing and their education. So there was a decrease in um, infant and child mortality rates as well. Now, it's important to note that the quality of health and hygiene was dramatically affected by differences in social class. Um, the wealthier Europeans would have access to the services of doctors, whereas the poor Europeans had to rely on popular healers with no real medical training. Everyone, however, was subject to diseases that resulted from tainted food, polluted water, and filthy streets. And even with the important advantages of the agricultural revolution, many areas were still quite susceptible to shortages of food, which could lead to starva starvation and malnutrition. But overall, there are some important improvements in public health. For example, draining low-lying sort of swampy areas um, to get rid of stagnant water or burying human refuse, which is like trash and, um, and things like that, and cleaning wells to allow for better water supplies, all of these things help lower death rates, especially from epidemic diseases. And the development of public health techniques was really an important breakthrough of the second half of the 18th century. This included improved practices in sanitation, early vaccinations, better clothing due to the proto-industrialization of the cottage industry, um, improvements in developing warm, dry housing, and of course, better food supplies due to the agricultural revolution. Now that's really important. It's important to note the significant changes now to diet and nutrition. So the diet of ordinary people improved significantly. Um, even poor people's diets could now consist of grains and vegetables. As I've mentioned, the potato was a really transformative um, crop that dramatically improved the diet of poor Europeans. Um, by giving them more nutrition, right? Because potatoes had more, they had more calories and they also had more vitamins like vitamins A and C. Now, some areas of Europe, like in Ireland, became so dependent on the potato. Uh, most Irish lived almost exclusively on the potato um, as many of them also lived in complete and abject poverty. Ireland was one of the poorest areas, especially in Western Europe. Um... And of course, that will not be good for the Irish much later on in the 19th century, but that's another story for another day. 
New crops from the New World led to a greater variety of vegetables that would exist in towns and cities, right? Again, allowing for a more diverse um, diet for even your average European. Whereas upper classes consumed much more meat, fish, and alcohol, they tended to not eat as many fruits and vegetables. Um, and greater affluence actually meant that people maybe didn't have the healthier the healthier diet. It meant that they had more indulgence, right? Especially in sugar and meat and carbs and things like that. Overall, Northern Europe and Atlantic Europe were had were better and had better healthier diets than say Southern Europe, the Mediterranean Europe, or even Eastern Europe, and the English probably had the best diet of them all. Now there were also important medical improvements that we start to see in the 18th century. As I've mentioned before, the bubonic plague had largely disappeared from Europe by the time we get to the 17th and even 18th century. But also, one of the most significant uh, medical improvements was the conquest of smallpox. So the conquest of smallpox is easily the greatest medical triumph of the 18th century. Um, even though we tend to associate the most devastation of, with smallpox in the New World, it was still uh, very, very devastating within Europe. For example, even in the 17th century, 25% of the deaths in Great Britain were caused by smallpox. It even killed members of the royal family. Um, and overall, it was not uncommon for Europeans to contract it, but it was just easier for them to maybe get over it occasionally. Now, Edward Jenner, Edward Jenner is um, the mastermind behind the conquest of smallpox. In 1778, he created the foundation for the science of immunology, which is vaccinations, by creating this early vaccine for smallpox. He discovered that by inoculating patients with cowpox, right, which is a, another sort of form of the disease found in livestock, it, this would control the potential onset of smallpox. Right, so the idea is that he's taking a small amount of a disease and implementing it into people, and that allowed them to develop the antibodies to prevent future um, exposure to the disease. But keep in mind, healthcare is still very, very rudimentary, especially to what we know now. Healthcare was still very limited by the lack of scientific knowledge. Um, even at the end of the 18th century, there was no nationwide organization or licensing programs that existed to distinguish proper doctors and physicians from, you know, essentially quacks and village healers and things like that. And the last point here is that the humanitarianism, uh, especially of the Enlightenment, led to more hospital reform. So hospitals began to evolve from charities that had focused on the moral worthiness of the poor. And now instead they were becoming medical institutions that defined patients by their diseases. Um, and ho as hospitals emerged, this helped to improve public health, right? By limiting disease and allowing for better treatment of disease and other ailments, limiting the spread of infection as well. And while this is very early and limited in the 18th century, this is a trend that will continue to grow in urban centers into the 19th century. All right, and so that is the end of our lecture. Please remember to do your write-up. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of your day.